What would it look like to practice the table fellowship of Jesus in our communities and neighborhoods in the 21st century? With whom would you struggle the most to include at your dinner table? And would you serve as a gracious host to people on the other side of the political divide? And what can we do as Christians to break down the cultural, political, and economic barriers between people and gather around our common bond in Jesus Christ at the dinner table? Good evening. My name is sous chef Aaron Williams, and we're so glad to have you with us here today. For the next several weeks, I invite you to join us as we engage in these penetrating questions and look at how Jesus did table fellowship and discover what it truly means to taste and see that the Lord is good. Bon appétit. Welcome friends, welcome to Sunday worship here on a overcast and muggy day here in Seattle. If you are joining us online, jump into that chat and connect with us and tell us where you're worshiping from. Jump into the chat and say hello to one another too. So today we are coming together to celebrate communion. And so you have a few minutes now to prepare a little piece of bread and some liquid. And then at, the, at that time during the worship service, we'll cut back and uh, you'll have some time to prepare your elements then. If you would like prayer at any time throughout the worship service, please hit that request prayer button in the, um, on your screen, or you can also send us an email at prayer at upc.org. And on August 27th, I'm not sure if you saw this, but we are going to have one big, huge worship service at 10 o'clock. And so we'll have big, uh, one big one, and there will be a fellowship afterward. So if you are able to um, join us here in Seattle, come. If you're not, maybe you can invite some of your friends to have worship with you and then have a little fellowship after we worship together. Now we're going to go into the fourth of Taste and See with Pastor Aaron leading the way and let's join our friends in the congregation and prepare our hearts for worship.
Amen. Thank you, Jamie and Corrine. We appreciate that beautiful rendition. That is beautiful. Let's give them another hand. Amen. Uh, well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for giving us this opportunity to worship him today in spirit and in truth. want to thank God for our online and radio uh, worshipers. We're glad to have you with us. And thank you for being here present in the sanctuary to worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Pastor Aaron. They affectionately call me Paul. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but that's what, that's kind of stayed with me. But uh, I serve as the pastor of care and kindred here at UPC. Um, uh, just first of all, uh, just, you know, we're, we're about joining Jesus to recon reconcile all people unto himself. And I want to ask you to do a big favor for me. I want to ask you to fill out a connect card. Uh, we want to connect with you, and we want you to connect with us. Uh, there's a connect card in the pew pocket uh, in front of you, or you can go to upc.org slash upc.org. Let's just say it that way. And uh, all, also, you can scan on the back of your, scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin. And uh, that would be a, a great uh, blessing for us. And if you're new here, uh, there's, we have a little gift for you at the uh, welcome table uh, if you fill out the, uh, the card and take it to the welcome table. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we're in our fourth installment of the series, Taste and See. And uh, God has been blessing us through uh, his goodness and he has been blessing us through this series. And uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about the etiquette of God's grace. And uh, we're just here to worship the Lord in the beauty, beauty of his holiness. And we thank you for coming uh, to be here with us. Let us worship God. Wow. Just as we do every Sunday morning, we have gathered to celebrate the grace of of Jesus Christ and to worship him and to give him thanks and praise. So I want to invite us as we begin now to stand together as you're able and let's sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound.
won't you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we thank you and praise you for your amazing grace. It's because of that grace that we can come to you in confidence, confessing our sins and asking for your mercy. And now we pray responsively. Merciful Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Say it with me. Lord, have mercy. Like Jonah, we have heard your clear command yet have run the other way. Lord, have mercy. Like Cain, we have hated our brother or sister and in our hatred have done them harm. Lord, have mercy. Like Peter, we have denied you in front of others, allowing fear rather than grace to dictate our actions and words. Lord, have mercy. In your mercy, Lord, forgive what we are and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, Psalm 103 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Be assured that his great mercy and love are yours as we sing this next song together. As you're able, let's stand as we sing. He will hold me fast. Yeah. 
is faithful, God is good, and we can rely upon him. Before you have a seat, I want to just invite you to take a moment. Greet those around you. Tell them how glad you are to see them today. Greeting to all of you. I see so many people in the chat saying hello, hello. It is awesome to see you all streaming in this morning. And you know what? We have global worship today because we have our friend Dayang from uh, Indonesia over here in YouTube. And I see Ginny from Meadowbrook over there. And then on the online chat side, it is awesome to see all of you. So if you haven't yet jumped in here and you see a friend you know and a name you know, say hello. Or you could just say hi to me. Um, wherever you may be, though, I'm wondering if it's muggy for you. We are muggy indoor and outdoor right now here. But uh, you know what? God is good, and he's going to keep us cool, isn't he? So um, let's just go back to the sanctuary, and let's join our friends and go to the next part of the worship service. Well, I would like to invite all of our UPC kids. Look, I put a sticky note on my notes so that I wouldn't forget. If you are in elementary and would like to head on back, your teachers and leaders are waiting for you in the back. Have a wonderful morning and thank you for beginning in worship with us this morning. Well, this summer we have been praying for our college students who are on deputation in Bolivia and Vietnam. And we continue, I invite you to continue to pray for them as they orient toward home. They'll be returning in the next week and a couple weeks. So please keep them in your prayers. And as we prepare our tithes and offerings this morning, I want to give you an update into the planning that we're doing for our college students who are returning this fall. Twice a week, our staff is focusing very specifically on college students on their return, on weekly programming for them, and for meaningful participation in the life of this church. A few things that we're looking forward to that I invite you to pray about is that the inn will continue on Tuesday nights, and that will begin on September the 26th, which is the first week of school uh, for the UW. And on Sunday mornings, we're excited to have a weekly brunch for college students, which will follow our second service. That will begin on October 1st and run throughout fall quarter. So we're excited about that. If you're not familiar with the academic calendar, uh, Seattle Pacific will begin uh, mid-September and the UW will begin at the end of September. So in the month of September, we're gonna see a lot of students returning specifically to our neighborhood here in the university district. And I encourage you to invite the students who are in your lives to worship with us on Sundays and on Tuesdays. As we consider the ways that we serve this church, I want to invite you to think about how God might be calling you to participate in the lives of students. One of our values is growing with students, and we know that as we engage with students, we also learn and grow. Next Sunday, we will be having a table in the narthex where you can sign up and learn about ways that you might be involved in our ministry to college students uh, this year. So I invite you to, to return next Sunday and to uh, talk to us in the narthex. As we give to God this morning, you know that we don't any longer pass an offering plate, but encourage you if you brought your gift, uh, there's a silver box in the narthex and two black boxes up in the balcony or you can give online at upc.org slash give. Let's pray God's blessing over our tithes and offerings. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have given to us. You have blessed us with the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and we are so grateful to be called your children. As we give to you this morning, we ask that you would bless and multiply our gifts. Use them for your purpose so that more might know of your saving grace. And God, we pray especially for the college and university students in our midst that you would do a new work in the lives of students in our neighborhood. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it is the presence of the Lord. Uh, we thank God for giving us another opportunity to worship him today in spirit and in truth. There's nothing that we've done that we deserve the right to be here. It's only by his grace and his mercy that we sit where we're sitting today and that I'm standing where I'm standing today. And for that alone, we ought to just give God a hand clap of praise, amen. Amen. Well, I got a short runway today. I'm going to have to take a few shortcuts, but uh, I appreciate your prayers, and we're going to we're going to get through this passage, and uh, and hit some things that we need to hit. Amen. Amen. And uh, hopefully, you have something to take home with you to apply to your life and to apply to my life as well. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for that laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've been talking about uh, taste and see uh, that the Lord is good. On, on last, last Sunday, I wasn't here, uh, Jedediah uh, preached on last Sunday, so I thank him for staying in, standing in my stead. So I'm, I'm back today. I would like to call your attention to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, it's on page 854 in your pew Bibles, and I ask that you would stand with me for the public reading of Scripture. Let us read together. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he is gone to be with the guest of whom, who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God lasts forever. You may be seated. For a little while, I would like to hang as a title over this text, the etiquette of God's grace, the etiquette of God's grace. The big idea of this passage is the grace of Jesus leads us to a repentant heart and restorative hands. You know, as I prepared for this message, I came across a scholarly journal called Country Living. <laughs> Amen, somebody. An etiquette columnist by the name of Catherine Newman talked about etiquette. And she says that the term is de derived from a French, from French culture and means little ethics, which is exactly why the practice is more, more significant now than ever before. Uh, she goes on to say that etiquette is a whole worldview and system of values, and it's how we live in community with other people, and is almost synonymous with kindness. Etiquette involves remembering that there are other people in the world with their own needs, feelings, and grief. 
Now, that's not how I typically think of etiquette. I'm, all, I'm thinking of etiquette as sitting at a table and making sure that everything is, is in the right place. But she said that the real meaning of etiquette, it, it's little ethics. And one writer put it this way. He said that etiquette is more than fussy rules laid down by stuffy people. <laughs> etiquette is the oil that lubricate society and reduces the friction of interpersonal relationships. Jesus is our model. He came to earth and took on our dress, customs, and manners in order to lead us to God. As his followers, we should see etiquette as a way to follow in his footsteps. I concur with that statement that we should see etiquette as a model to follow in Jesus' footsteps. As I mentioned that our theme is to taste and see that the Lord is good and happy are those who take refuge in him. But underneath the surface of this passage, I see the the etiquette of God's grace at work. It's not the etiquette of the world, but it's etiquette from a higher place, from Jesus, from heaven, and there's a way Jesus operates that's countercultural to the society and the culture that he lives in. He respects the culture, but Jesus clearly understands that etiquette was made for man and not man for etiquette. And so here we find in this passage of scripture, we are introduced to a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is really a, a case study, if you will, in the salvific activity of God and the mission of Jesus Christ, as we'll see at the end of this passage. But we also see that because of grace and Zacchaeus' uh, exposure to God's grace, that grace changes everything in Zacchaeus' life. He really takes in the grace of Jesus Christ, and, and the moment he lays eyes on Jesus, grace takes over. And the grace of Jesus as we see throughout Luke's writings, it, it makes room for outsiders. We see here that Zacchaeus, we, we find here that Zacchaeus is someone who, uh, who is an outsider. Uh, we find here that Zacchaeus, uh, find a little information about him, that he, he's a chief tax collector, and this is the only place in Scripture that we see the term chief tax collector, and he was rich. Luke wants us to know that he was the chief tax collector and he was rich. Now, we know tax collectors during that, day, during that time were despised by the Jewish people because they were hired by the Roman government to tax their own people. And Zacchaeus, uh, according to this story, seems to, seems to imply that he took, off, he took out a little extra for himself. Let's just put it that way. When he taxed the people, he, he made sure that he took out a little extra for himself. But it also appears to me that Zacchaeus is the president of the chief of the tax collectors association. He's the one who, uh, whenever a tax collector under his association collects money, he gets a little bit from them as well. He gets some commissioning from them. And so we find here that he's a chief tax collector, he's, he's, uh, he's rich, but he had one problem when, he, when we look at this passage. It says he entered Jericho, Jesus, and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he 
could not see because he was short in stature. Now, uh, you know, Luke has, you know, I don't think Luke is making fun of Zacchaeus. He's just making it plain. He's saying that he was short in stature. So there, there was one problem that he had, that he could not see Jesus, but he wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. The crowd that surrounded Jesus obstructed his view. But Luke goes on to say that he was short in stature. And that was the real reason he could not get a clear view of Jesus. But Zacchaeus didn't let that stop him, brothers and sisters. Uh, he was determined to, to see Jesus. And one of the things I want to point out at, very, at the very beginning is Zac Zacchaeus may have been short in stature, but he was tall in humility. He was tall in humility. You see, it, it takes humility to follow Jesus. When we're short in humility, we tend to be tall in pride. Humility always catches God's attention. And such is the case here. Andrew Murray, who wrote that great book on humility, put it this way. He says, humility is the only soil in which virtue takes root. A lack of humility is the explanation of every defect and failure in human life. Humility is not so much a virtue along with the others, but it is the root of all other virtues because it alone takes the right attitude before God and allows him as God to do all. This is what Andrew Murray said. It, it, it's the root of all other virtues. And through that virtue, God is able to give us grace. Through that virtue, God is able to give us mercy. Through that virtue, God is able to, to work in our lives. After all, that's why Peter said God gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud. So Zacchaeus, it's, it's, his his actions depict that he was short in stature, but he was tall in humility. Look at what it says here, that he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed a sycamore tree. Now, Zacchaeus is a rich man. He's a chief tax collector. But his desire to see Jesus seems to imply that he has a childlike faith, that he's willing to even climb a tree to get a picture of Jesus, to get a view of Jesus. Uh, after all, Scripture does tell us that, that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to have the faith of a child. And this certainly seems the case with Zacchaeus, that he humbles himself. He swallows his pride. And in his mind, he's saying, I've got to get a view of Jesus. I've got to get a clear view of Jesus. And to this day, the sycamore tree represents clarity. It represents getting a clear view. The sycamore tree from that day forward had a, had a new meaning to it. And so here we find he was short in stature, but tall in Humility. And brothers and sisters, if we want to really catch God's attention, we've got to humble ourselves. Because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But not only that, Zacchaeus was tall in faith. He didn't let the crowd keep him from seeing Jesus. He, when we're short in faith, we, we have a tendency to be tall in fear. Fear paralyzes us and holds us back. Faith pushes us forward and always compels us to move forward in the spirit of God. God did not call us to live a life of fear, brothers and sisters. He called us to live a life 
of faith. As that old King James translation says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We see this in Zacchaeus' life that he is tall in faith. Don't let the crowd obstruct your view of Jesus. Don't let the crowd keep you from getting close to Jesus. Don't let uh, the vicissitudes of life and people distract you from Jesus. Get that clear view of Jesus. If you have to move some people out of the way, move them out of the way because sometimes they, they take energy from you and you need to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen? Charles Spurgeon once said that the fear of God is the death of every other fear. Like a mighty lion, it chases all other fears before it. When we have a, a fear of God, a reverence for God, it, it implies that the death of every other fear because when God is bigger than your fears, when he's bigger than your enemies, it drives out all other fears before it. But here's the thing that, that I, I really see in this text is that as throughout Luke's gospel, there's, there's, there are these antagonists that we call the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. But they're always critiquing Jesus. They're always watching Jesus have fellowship with tax collectors, uh, with sinners. And... Zacchaeus, being the chief of tax collectors, as far as they were concerned, didn't have a right to be at their table. That is, the table of their father Abraham. They were more concerned about their ethnic identity than they were about their spiritual identity. Don't allow your ethnic identity to become a form of idolatry. Don't, don't get me wrong, your ethnicity is important, but not as important as your identity in Christ. So don't allow your, your blackness or your whiteness or your Asian identity keep you from wholeheartedly following Jesus Christ. This is what we see with the Pharisees, that they, they were more concerned about lifting up their Jewishness, their pride, rather than, and that's one of the reasons they missed who Jesus was, because they were stuck up on themselves and their ethnic identity. They had turned their ethnicity into a form of idolatry. But we see here that it, it takes faith to follow Jesus. It takes faith to really know who Jesus is. It takes faith to, to taste Jesus, as we mentioned in, in other earlier sermons, that taste represents experience. Taste cultivates an appetite, and it's clear that Zacchaeus has already cultivated an appetite for Jesus. And when you have an appetite for Jesus, it spoils your appetite for anything else. When you've had a taste of Jesus, you don't want to taste any uh, gods with a little g. You want to taste the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with a big g. You want to taste God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Zacchaeus <laughs> tasted the grace of God on that day. And grace changed everything for Zacchaeus. I can only imagine Zacchaeus being the only chief tax collector, it being a, a lonely world for him. I can only imagine that Zacchaeus, all of his life, he... He felt like an outsider, and so this career helped him to objectify himself. 
and to make himself feel good. But at some point in Zacchaeus' life, he got tired of it. And somewhere in the back of his mind, he's saying, if I can just see Jesus. <laughs> what a beautiful story because as Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus, Jesus had already seen Zacchaeus. And so when Zacchaeus is up in the tree, and the text says, as Jesus was passing by, he saw, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus in the tree. And he says to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. First of all, you know, we've been, I've been teaching this class called The Art of Neighboring, and one of the main things it says in the class, the book says, get to know your neighbor's names. You get to know their names. So here in this text, somehow, well, I think Jesus had an edge on us. He, he knows everybody's name. Amen. But he looks up and he says to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Now, this word must is sprinkled throughout Luke's writings. And it captures the, the missionary activity of God through Jesus Christ. So you see this word must, it's, it's the, the Greek word dei, D-E-I, -D but it, it, it implies that Christ's steps were ordered by God the Father, that Jesus never took a step out of line with where the Father was taking him. Like you and I, we wonder. But Jesus always knew where he was going. He had an internal compass that he always knew where he was going. And so he tells Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Now that really excited Zacchaeus because he, he just thought he would just get a glimpse of Jesus. But it, this excited him. So it says, so he hurried down and was happy to welcome him was happy to welcome him. He, he was happy to, to host him. He was happy to have Jesus as a guest in his home. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Zacchaeus tasted the grace of God that day. He discovered that that day, what Paul discovered, that God's grace is sufficient. That Jesus is never short on grace. And neither should we as his followers be short on grace. God's grace is sufficient to save us and to affirm us. And on that day, Jesus saves Zacchaeus, but he also affirms him when he has been uh, an outsider all of his life. Now Jesus makes Zacchaeus an insider. One of the old mothers at the church that I, that I used to pastor, whenever we, I talked about grace in my sermons, she would always give me this note that captures the, uh, the acrostic of grace. She said, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is, is free to us, but it costs Jesus his life. Grace is free to us, and so God doesn't want us to have a wimpy grace. He wants us to understand that we are all recipients of his grace, and it costs Jesus everything. Amen, somebody. But my concern, my concern, brothers and sisters, in this day and age is the way we sometimes behave as Christians leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the world. Let me, let me say that again. Now, I'm not talking about anybody in, in church, in this church. 
The way we sometimes behave as Christians leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the world. And when they get a taste of our bad behavior, they're saying, I don't want to have anything to do with your Christ until you act like you are redeemed. I think that's why Paul tells us in Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with a little salt. I like that. I like, I like the way Paul says that, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Did you hear what Paul said? Let your conversation at the front of your mind, before you even start talking, think about grace first. Think about how God talks to you. Think about the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before any thoughts come out of our minds, we, we need to think about God's grace. Let your conversation always, not sometimes, but always full of grace and seasoned with salt. The implication is, is be firm. As one, one of my professors used to say, be, be as Tough-minded, be tough-minded and tender-hearted when you speak to someone. The beauty of this passage is that Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' home. Has anybody ever invited themselves, themselves to your house? Have they, have they ever called you and said, I'm coming to your house? I'm not talking about your mom. I'm not talking about your dad. I'm talking about a stranger saying, I'm coming to your house today. Jesus invites himself. We see another motif in this passage is that Jesus does not, Jesus never sees himself as a guest. He always sees himself as a host. And here in this passage, Jesus again becomes the host. Jesus took the initiative and extended grace to Zacchaeus. He had a divine appointment with him. He didn't listen to the collective voice of the crowd, gossiping and murmuring of the crowd. Jesus received his cues from heaven, and the voice of the Father was louder than the voice of the crowd. And no doubt, when Jesus got to Zacchaeus' home, they reclined at a table, and they enjoyed table fellowship together. And he experienced for himself the sweetness of Jesus Christ. Before he met Jesus, he was an outsider. Before he met Jesus, he was lonely. Before he met Jesus, he was discouraged. But after he met him, he was an insider. After he met him, he tasted the, the sweetness of Jesus Christ. After he met him, he tasted God's grace. After he met Jesus, grace changed everything in Zacchaeus' life. Grace changes everything in our life if we let it. If we really appropriate the, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why Peter said, and out of all people, Peter knows what grace means. Peter says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Todd Bolsinger wrote a book, one of my favorite books. It's called, It Takes a Church to Raise a Christian. And he's written many great books, but in the introduction, he says something that really has captured my attention over the years. He says, today, like most days, People will gather around tables, coffee tables, drawing tables, breakfast and dinner tables, boardroom tables, picnic tables, and school tables. Families will discuss problems, joys, and the details of the day. Deals will be made and divorce settlements finalized. Papers will be signed and friendships will be renewed. 
Milk will be spilt and puzzles will be built. Homework will be done and bills will be left unpaid. The table, maybe more than any other item, is universal, necessary, and ordinary. It is around tables that life is lived, and it is at tables that perhaps unexpectedly God can be found. You see, the tables that we sit at every day point to a greater table. The table, the desk, the kitchen table, the table on our jobs, the lunch table points to a greater reality. Because for this table, he died. For this table, he rose. For this table, everybody is invited to this table. Several years ago, brothers and sisters, my wife and I, well, back, back in those days, dear, we, we had more date nights. <laughs> but my wife and I went to a restaurant in Kirkland, and we were just enjoying one another's company. It was late in the evening. There we were sitting, we were looking over the menu, and this blonde-haired, blue-eyed lady, who seemed to be intoxicated, I might add, she comes to our table and says, do you mind if I sit here? And before we could say yes or no, she had already sat down. <laughs> and she began to ask us questions, and then, you know, that classic question, what kind of work do you do? My wife laughed. I laughed. And I think my wife said it first. Well, my husband is a pastor. And she looks up at heaven and she says, God, are you messing with me? <laughs> at that table. And she begins to share her story with, with us that she had in her mind fallen from grace, that she grew up in the church and that she came from a Christian family. And somehow she saw herself as falling from grace. And she began to cry and weep. And we told her that God is a God of second chances. There's no one beyond the scope of God's grace. God can bring you back. He still has his eyes on you. The very fact that you're sitting at this table means that God is messing with you because he loves you. Amen. And we prayed with her that day. And we never saw her again. We encouraged her that day. And from time to time, I'm thinking about her and always praying for her. That Lord, I pray that the day she sat at our table, you use that day to bring her back to yourself. Let your table be the same kind of table. That somebody needs to know that Jesus still saves. Somebody needs to know that Jesus is still able to do exceedingly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or even think. Let your table point them to this table that Jesus died and he rose again and declared that all power is in his hands. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the etiquette of your grace, that no one is beyond the scope of your grace. We thank you for how you use Zacchaeus as a case study of your grace and mercy. And Lord, may we be tall in repentance. May we be tall in humility. May we be tall in grace. And may we point people to a greater reality. The small tables that we sit at every day, that there's a big table. 
that all of us gather around and celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would touch somebody, whether they're on the radio, online, or in this room, that God still saves, that he still affirms that we are image bearers of him, that he still loves and still cares. Would you draw them to yourself, Lord, and make it clear that you're inviting them to your family, but you also want to restore them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It is in his precious, pleasing, and perfect name we pray. Amen. God's riches at Christ's expense. I want to invite you to stand with me. We're going to sing just one stanza of hymn number 213, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs> I have a pastoral announcement. Uh, on August, uh, August the 3rd, Ruth Ann Story passed away. We remember Ruth Ann's husband, Tom, and their family in our prayers. And the memorial service for Jean Nelson will be on August 11th at 1 p.m. in Geneva Hall. Would you join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we continue to praise and thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for speaking through Pastor Aaron this morning. May we remember your grace each time we sit down at a table. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to this church and this congregation. You are so good. And this morning we pray for the people of this church family. We pray for our neighbors and our world. God, we pray for the Story family as they grieve the loss of Ruth Ann. Would you bring your comfort to Tom and the family as they remember, celebrate, and mourn? God, we pray for Linda Burley and her siblings as they mourn the passing of their father this week. We pray for Kathleen Bryan and Betsy Mullen in the loss of Kathleen's daughter and Betsy's sister, Carolyn Bryan Ohm, who passed away this week. God, we pray for those who are mourning. We pray for healing and comfort for Misrak after a work injury, for Dory as she cares for her father on hospice, and for Sandy's recovery from surgery as she battles cancer. Lord, we know there are many others in our midst who need your healing touch, and we name them to you in our hearts. God, we pray for unity in your church. Would you open, your, open our eyes to the work that you are doing in our midst? God, we pray for Pastor George as he finalizes his planning for the coming year. Thank you for meeting him and speaking to him. Lord, the needs of our city and world are great, and sometimes they are overwhelming. We trust in your mighty power and know that you work all things for your glory. And so when we are burdened, distraught and consumed, would you remind us of the hope we have in you? You are the anchor for our souls, firm and secure. And now we pray the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time for us to come to the big table that takes precedence over all other tables. Now it's time for us to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to partake of this bread and this wine. Uh, we do want to uh, invite our service to come forward at this time. And we're going to, first of all, read the Sursum Corda uh, that will show up on the screen at this time. Let us stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. You may be seated. You know, there are only two ordinances that we observe in Scripture, and one is baptism, and the other one is the Lord's Supper. And I want you to imagine today being in that upper room with Jesus' disciples. He was with his most dearest friends as they gathered in the upper room. Picture yourself in there. I know it's kind of tight in there, but see yourself in that upper room. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the wine and he said, this wine is sealed in the New Testament in the New Covenant of my blood and do this in remembrance of me. This is my body which is given for you. And he goes on to say that as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this wine, you do proclaim my salvific death until I come back. And so as we gather together, brothers and sisters, we do this in remembrance of him. And as we come to this table, I invite you to come down the side aisles and then work your way up the middle aisle. And once you return to your seat, please have a seat and feel free to partake of the elements um, as you sit in your seat. But also there are prepackaged uh, communion kits here, and there's some gluten-free bread here that's optional, and you can come to, the, come to this table to get the gluten-free and get, I will bring those of you who are not able to make it to the table here, uh, make it up front here, I will bring those to you as well. And also, uh, we want to just invite you to come and receive the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us stand and come forward. For those of you worshiping with us online, uh, you can go ahead and hit pause on your um, screen if you need to pause it to go and prepare your elements. If you already have them with you, as you heard from Pastor Aaron, you want to just have a little cup of liquid or juice or something and then a little piece of bread or cracker. And we are taking communion through the intinction method, which is that you take, the, you take your piece of bread and you dip it in the cup. And when you are ready, 
um, just pray for thanks for what Jesus has done for us. And as Pastor Aaron said today, his grace is free and it cost him his life, but it is for us. And so I pray and uh, just such a blessing to celebrate this moment with you. And then you can come back and hit play again and we'll rejoin our friends in the sanctuary. So with that, this is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. special uh, time of prayer and commissioning. Uh, we have a, 
a Bosnia mission team, uh, Linda Quist and Dee Dee Kersley, uh, going uh, along with many others as well, who are going to Bosnia. And she shared with me earlier that she this is your tenth time going to Bosnia. Maybe twelve. Twelve. Wow. Hey, Amen. Let's give her a hand. So how, how can we pray for you? And just tell us just a little bit about it. Well, my earnest prayer is that the people of Bosnia will hunger for God's word and that they will come to know the Lord. Um, it's, a, it's a hard place to sow the seed. And the uh, pastors and the Christian workers need encouragement and strength. Amen. Amen. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you for this, uh, this moment. Uh, we thank you, dear God, for the Bosnia mission team, dear God. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for Linda, and uh, we thank you for Didi, and all the others who will be going uh, on this trip, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will give them grace for the journey, uh, that you would uh, give them clarity, dear God. And we pray, Father God, that you would give them discernment and that they will be led by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, the relationships that they have already established, dear God, we pray that they will even be cultivated to go even deeper, Lord God. And Lord, we pray that you will get the glory out of this trip, Lord God. We pray that you will re reveal a, a side of yourself that uh, neither Linda or Dee Dee or anyone has ever seen before, that there's uh, your grace and your character is inexhaustible. And so, Lord God, we just pray that uh, as they make their way there, we pray for uh, grace for the journey, Lord God, and we pray that you would protect them from danger seen and unseen, Lord. Pray for the pastors there, Lord, who are on the mission field and missionaries, dear God, who are working in Bosnia, Lord. Pray for their protection, Lord God, and that you would give them favor every step of the way, Lord God. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, be God in this situation, Lord. We know that you, you to be a God who is able to do exceedingly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or even think. And we thank you in advance, Lord, for what you're getting ready to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Let's give them a hand. I uh, just want to just make a few announcements as we get ready to go down from this place. Uh, on August 27th, there will be one service at 10 o'clock, August 27th. Uh, we're closing the series, uh, Taste and See, and there will be uh, some food after the service. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it's going to be a, a celebration uh, on that particular day. I uh, also just want to thank you for your, your, your giving and pray that you continue to continue to give strong. Uh, there are uh, offering boxes up in the balcony and there's a silver box in the narthex as we continue to advance the kingdom of God and, and continue to edify God's people. There's also coffee and cocoa in Geneva. And, uh, and most importantly, there's fellowship in Geneva. So uh, get to know someone, greet somebody. Uh, today, and uh, just remember today uh, that your table is a microcosm of this table, and that God wants to use you to bring people to Himself. Amen. 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 Well, let us stand and receive the benediction. Father, we thank you for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard, and we pray, dear God, that you'll help us not only to be hearers of your word, but also doers that we may be blessed in all that we do according to your will. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide within us, now henceforth and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. 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 amen.
thank you for worshiping with us at University Presbyterian Church. It is such a joy to be with you online and to know you're a part of this church family as God calls us to go next door and to love our neighbors. This week, remember, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God is making his appeal through us. Isn't that amazing? Well, listen, take care, have a great week, and we look forward to being with you again next week.